The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of At the Heart of Business. I am your host, Judith Tate. At the Heart of Business is a conversation with women in business discussing their challenges and successes. I'd love to welcome our first guest today, Val Vagopoulos of Ladies Who Dine. Welcome, Val. Thank you for having me and well done on the last name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, as you know, I grew up in East York, so I'm a, you know, honorary uh, member of the Greek community. And you are. I can pronounce every single Greek name, doesn't matter how many letters are in it, I can pronounce every single Greek name perfectly. <laughs> That's my girl. Yeah. <laughs> So Val, a uh, fellow East Yorker, I used to go to school with Val. Well, we went to school at the same, the same school at the, around the same time, but right. we don't really remember each other, but uh, we made that connection when we, we met to talk about the show and I'm just so excited to, to have you here. So tell us about Ladies Who Dine. I've heard so many wonderful things about it. Well, uh, it's something that I started, uh, I think back in 2016, um, when I owned the olive oil store in Whippy, um, it was just something that I, you know, when they say you want to see change in the world, just be the change. Yes. So I saw that women weren't supportive and very catty. So I allowed women that had side hustles or full-time hustles to come into my store, set up for free and tell them or, uh, or say, you know, let's, feed off each other. Let's make money off each other. Let's expand our customer base together. And then that turned into going to restaurants and then we outgrew restaurants. Um, and it just got so big with such a good vibe of women in Durham region that were so supportive and so amazing that now we've partnered up with the owner of Butchies, uh, Andrea Nicholson, that has an event space um, called Dish Play in Whippy. And it's just, it's just about women in business or wanting to get into business or just wanting to meet people in the community, just come out, have a great meal and socialize and grow your business. That's amazing. And it's, it's nice that you saw a need in the community and then you filled that need. Yeah. So you mentioned that, um, like women in business, like they just weren't supporting each other or being very catty. Like where, where would you see that or experience that? Like, did you experience it personally or did you just see it happening to other women in the community? Like what was, uh, how did that come about? Both. Uh, it, I experienced it myself, like in, in the store, if it's weird when, I don't know if it's a jealousy thing on other women or, or they just didn't like me because I have that personality, whether you like me or you don't, there's no <laughs> kind of in between. Um, and they would purposely go out of their way not to come in or not to buy from you. If I did a show or like a trade show, they would purposely like turn, like they know me and they would turn their heads and try not to make eye contact. Um, and then I saw like other women bullying other women in business where they threatened to cancel, you know, how I feel about the cancel culture, but uh, I won't tolerate it. I won't. And it's just something like, I got to change this. We got to change the attitude. We're supposed to be, you know, sisters help each other. We're women. Like, why are we not helping each other? Why are we trying to break each other down? So I wanted to be that change and that's what I'm doing. That's really good. I never, cause I've, I've only been in the business world for almost seven years now. And I've never, I've never experienced that personally, but mm -hmm. I've heard other women say that they've gone through that. And it just, it's really shocking because as you said, like we're, we're women, we're business owners, we're in the same community. We should be supporting each other right. because like my success is your success and vice versa. Right. So yeah. I just, I don't understand that. But as you said, like sometimes it's just, it's just jealousy um, they see that you're doing well mm -hmm. and that's just for whatever reason, that's their response rather than reaching out to you and saying, Hey, you know, I'd love to chat with you. You see what you're doing and yep. maybe you can help me. So good, good for you for really, uh, seeing that, identifying that and then doing something about it. 
I've been on the other foot. Like I've been at a trade show where yeah. I see a booth and they're killing it. Like they're making money hand over fist and I'm just sitting there doing nothing. I've been on that side. You yeah. know what I mean? But what women don't realize is if you get out there and meet people, there's so many people that will help you. Yes. Out of the kindness of their heart will help you grow your business. Yeah. For nothing, for no reason. And that's what Ladies Who Dine is all about. And the women that come to the event, the the vibe, like they're just, they're just so, I can't even put it in enough words what great vibes we have. Like it's so amazing, so supportive. I can imagine. I can't wait to go to uh, your event that's happening. Well, right now it's happening next week. By the time the show airs, it will have happened already, but I'm, I'm looking forward to going. Um, but, but you mentioned that it's, it's good to really get out there and network and, you know, speak to other women in business and stuff. But a lot of women, they have, and I'm just saying women, because that's always my, my focus, mm -hmm. uh, women in business. A lot of women are, they're a little hesitant or maybe too shy or very introverted. And going out to an event, it's just, it's overwhelming for them or it just might be a little scary. What would you, like, how would you really encourage someone who's feeling that way and they're kind of hesitant to come out to an event like yours, what, what would you say to them or what words of advice could you give? Just take the first step and come out and yeah. you will be shocked. There's so many, like the last ladies who died that we had, there were a few people that didn't even want to come out that usually did come out. Some one person was depressed because COVID really hit them hard and they just didn't want to come out. And I said, just come, just take that first step. You're going to know some people, you're going to meet new people and thanked me after the fact of forcing them to come out and socialize. It's just taking that first step. And I have to say, we are a group of women that are non-judgmental. We don't care. Just come. We don't care what you look like. If you look like crap that day, you didn't feel like putting your makeup on. Who cares? Just come. Just yeah. have a drink, have a glass of water, even just come out and say hello. And you'll see the difference. So it, everything will change. Love it. And where do you normally hold your events? Dish play. So uh, yeah, uh, 12 Stanley Court in Whitby. It's a phenomenal place. Andrea Nicholson has really done a great job uh, at this event space. It's very industrial, very modern, very cool looking. Um, and it's massive, absolutely massive. Uh, and her, her cooking is unbelievable. Yes, I know I've, I've been to Butchies, yeah. I don't know how many times, and it's just like, I'm scared to go in because I want everything on the menu, and it's just I know. so good. <laughs> but that's nothing. Her restaurant, Butchies, like, she has a whole other, like, she is so talented. Yeah. Our first meal when we launched, we had a braised beef. Oh, my God. It just melted in your mouth. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yay. Yeah. So <laughs> what kind of challenges have you faced in business? Okay, so, well, nothing anybody wouldn't face, whether I'm female or male. I'm, uh, you know, there's licensing, there's things like that. But um, I think the biggest hindrance for me is probably myself, hmm. you know, my own self doubt or what's that imposter syndrome? Like, who's going to want to come to me? Who's going to want to listen to me? Um, I think that's my biggest challenge is myself. And just getting out there. I love that. And I really love that you mentioned imposter syndrome mm -hmm. because we all struggle with it. It mm -hmm. is just, I don't know, it's a, it's a big, it's a big problem. And I, I've done the same thing. Like who's, who's going to want to be coached by me? Like, who am I to be coaching somebody? Who am I to be helping someone build their, their business to, to six figures. Meanwhile, I've done that myself, Right. But there's, <laughs> it's always like, why would anyone hire me to do that? And we really have to, we have to get out of our heads and really yes. see our value and, and your um, worth. Yes, that's right. Your value and your worth, especially mm -hmm. your worth. Mm -hmm. And that all comes down to charging what you're worth <laughs> and a lot of women undercharge because they don't see their value or their worth. And then they worry about, oh, well, you know, no one's going to be able to afford it. It's like the people that need your services will find the money. Right. They'll be able to afford it. So, so true. My nephew yells at me all the time. Stop with this imposter syndrome. Stop it. 
You know, uh, I, and I've helped so many women in business through ladies who dine or just being friends. I've helped a lot because I've learned a lot. I've lost a lot. I've won some, I've started so many businesses. I failed a ton of times, but you take each failure as a lesson and it's only made me better. And I, yeah, I have to stop doubting myself because I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm very grateful and very blessed. Amazing. What's been your biggest win? Well, this year has probably been my biggest. Um, I had brain surgery, so I got through that. That was, I just wanted to get through that. But um, my biggest win for me is my life right now. I'm extremely happy. I've got no static, no negativity, extremely positive. Um, and I've created multiple successful businesses. It's great. And I have a great marriage, which is easy. I don't have kids, but it's very easy. <laughs> and you know what? It doesn't, I mean, marriage is marriage and then kids are kids, right? So it's not yeah. like not having kids just makes your marriage easier. It's just marriage. Is, it's about uh, compromise and, and love and respect. So that's, that's amazing that you have uh, a great marriage. I'm and a very lucky girl. You, oh yeah. That's, that's great. It's good to recognize that. Yeah. Um, but he's also a very lucky man, right? Yes, so, he is. <laughs> and I assume he's very supportive of your business. He is, but he challenges me too. He, he, oh. I'll come up with ideas and he'll challenge me. And this is sometimes where the self-doubt comes in and, you know, but it's a good challenge, right? It's healthy, makes you think, gives you that critical thinking capabilities. And give us an example of how he would challenge you. I want to spend money. <laughs> like, let's create a new website. And he's, he's old school, right? So when I'm talking about social media, marketing, anything like that, he doesn't, he doesn't comprehend it. It's like, you know, what happened to advertising in the newspaper? Just mm. that kind of things like things have changed. He's not on social media whatsoever. He doesn't have a Facebook, nothing. He doesn't, I still have to teach him how to reply to an email. So oh <laughs> that's how old school he is. But um, so the, that's pretty much the biggest challenge that he challenges me with is money. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Good to have that in your life. Yeah. And how are you unique compared to your competitors? Girl, have you met me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm a straight shooter. So uh, I say it like it is. I don't lie. I cuss a lot, a lot. Um, but I'm very accepting of everybody. I don't care what you do, what you do for a living, um, your political views, your social views. I don't care. As long as you're a nice person, I'm accepting. My mom always said, a uh, house will always fit good people, right? So um, I think me being so accepting and open to everybody makes me different. That's amazing. I love that so much. And yeah. in 10 seconds, your message of love, light, and inspiration. Oh my God, that pressure. I don't yeah. know. I know. <laughs> Just be authentically you. Be authentic. That's it. Beautiful. Love it. Thank you so much, Val, for joining us. Thank you for having me. This was amazing. And it was amazing meeting you. Yes, amazing meeting you too. And stay tuned. We will be chatting with Serena Holmes next. Brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit Rogers.com for more details. Connection. We all need it. We live for it. It makes us feel like we're a part of something bigger. It makes us laugh, cry, and scream out for the world to hear. Connecting Canadians has been our focus for over 60 years. 
and it's just the beginning. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to At the Heart of Business. I'm your host, Judith Tate. At the Heart of Business is a conversation with women in business discussing their challenges and successes. I'd like to welcome our next guest, Serena, Serena Holmes. Welcome, Serena. Hey, how are you today? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. So tell us all about your investing business and your real estate business. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's been obviously quite the journey the last time that we spoke. You know, I still had my agency running, so I had a brand experience agency based in Pickering, but we operated all across the country. And through that, we started staffing events for an organization that teaches all different kinds of strategies and systems for real estate investing. So I had the opportunity to kind of dive in and, you know, do a number of different things that we obviously talked about. So I did some pre-construction, land development, syndicated mortgages and stuff like that. And really the, the goal with that was to start decreasing my dependency on my business. And I know that sounds strange because when you have a business, (laughs) like obviously you want to be taking money from it. But at that point in time, I was trying to start my family. And I just didn't want to be as dependent on the money from my business, just in case things slowed down when I had my daughter. So through those opportunities, I was able to generate, you know, various sources of passive income. And then once, you know, one person, they introduced you to another person and it, it snowballed into private lending and things like that. So essentially I was able to cut my pay in half, um, basically the year before my daughter was born And then COVID hit when she was three months old. And I obviously didn't want to take any money out because we couldn't operate anymore. So I literally was able to ramp up my private lending business. Um, So basically loaning money to private um, companies for real estate investing purposes. And I've been living off it ever since. (laughs) So that's, that's pretty awesome. I'm still, as you know, like I'm, I'm kind of diving into the whole real estate investing in private lending world and it's there's there's just so much and also so (laughs) many possibilities and you've always been fabulous in sharing opportunities with me so how for someone who's interested in in getting into private lending or real estate investing what how would you say what's the best way for them to get started yeah i mean i think part of it is also understanding your comfort level with risk so there's different kind of levels of um, commitment and risk that you could consider. So for someone that's completely risk adverse, they might want to consider something like a first position secured mortgage. So that basically means that you've got the same rights and privileges as a bank. Um, the trade-off is that your interest may not necessarily be as high as something like um, a promissory note or an unsecured lend. So in that instance, someone's personally guaranteeing it. So if anything goes wrong, it doesn't mean that um, you know there's not any way to necessarily collect on the funds owed to you, but it's not quite the same as the way like a mortgage would be. So the difference there could be something like 10 to 12% or 10 to 13% on a first position secured mortgage. A second position could be something in the range of 13 to 15% where an unsecured lend could be in the range of 15 to 20%. So these are something that are paid monthly. Um, so like I said, I've been able to really live off that cash flow. And because I've been chasing the interest, because I use my home equity line of credit to invest with, um, at the end of the day, I just try to diversify as much as possible. So I just make sure that I go with the minimums and I'd rather loan to a lot of different companies than obviously doing too much with one company. And that way I try to insulate my risk just in the unforeseen situation you know, anything possibly goes wrong. Wow. Okay. That's a lot. Of stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's <great> information. <laughs> and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Okay. Yeah. So what, um, so you mentioned using like your home equity line of credit to, yeah. to invest. Um, what other sources can people use if they don't have that or don't want to use that? Yeah. So there are different options. Obviously cash or savings would be one. Um, A lot of companies are now taking registered funds. So there's a lot of REITs coming out, um, you know, mutual or uh, MFTs. So mutual fund trust. So you can take RSPs or TFSAs. So again, it depends on what you're looking for. If you want the monthly cash flow, then registered funds may may not yield something like that. That could be more of something that is locked away for a certain period of time. Um, You know, I use a HELOC because it's not like I necessarily had 
you know, the stack of cash sitting away, but I do have a lot of equity in my home. And then the value of that is that the interest is also tax deductible because you're putting it towards something that's earning income for you. So if, for example, you're making $100,000 a year through all of these investments, but you put $30,000 on interest, then that's basically coming off. So you're your taxes ultimately would be probably in the range of 70,000 just to give like very, very simple numbers. Oh, wow. Okay. Awesome. So what was your, what, what's your, your biggest why for, for getting into this um, type of business? Because it's not like a, like a traditional business or even something that a lot of women are involved in. Now yeah. that I'm kind of diving into that world, I see more women involved, but it's just not something that a lot of women can see themselves in a position to do. And I've actually yeah. heard or, or seen stories of women who they started with, with nothing and they got into this and now they're doing well. So what, what's your why? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, like I said, I was just, I was in a service-based business, right? So I think I just wanted to make sure that I had other sources of income come again based on the personal things that were happening. But I think it's not necessarily mainstream. When people think about real estate investing, they think, oh, I've got to buy a rental property and be a landlord. And, you know, I think that can discourage people for a number of reasons, like affordability, you know, the LTB yeah. rules here in Ontario are not really very friendly <laughs> for investors, but there are other options. Like there's other markets that you can consider, you know, for me, I didn't have time. So I had an infant at home. So that was, you know, really big factor. And it was just something at the time that was almost like easy. Like once you meet different people in the community and you start meeting other people, it, it just, a lot of the referrals continue to spiral. So I think for someone that's brand new, that would like to consider this, I'd say definitely just try to grow your network. There are a lot of organizations out there and you know, even groups of people that share these opportunities constantly. And, and essentially I just, I set up calls with all the people I was referred to, to feel out if I was comfortable with what they had to offer, see, you know, how they communicated with their investors, what their terms were like, what the exit strategies were like, and things like that, just to, um, you know, get my feet wet. And then it just literally, it grew from there. So I, I did, you know, say an average of three to five lens a year for the first few years. And then I think last year I did 26. <laughs> so I really, like I had a big jump. Um, so I just signed, I think my 59th deal in the last five years. So. Wow. And you know what? The first thing that comes to my head is do you not possibly run out of money at some point? Like that's a lot of deals. So that tells me that you yeah. are doing amazing in this job. Well, I mean, they're always, um, you know, they're always coming to end points, right? So yeah. some of the loans could be as short as two weeks. So it could be, oh, for okay. example, someone that wants to pay off their line of credit before their mortgage closes, and they just need a short term bridge loan. So I think I did four or five of those last year that could be like two weeks, six weeks, two months. Um, and then other times it could be longer, like if they're doing a conversion project or land development, then it could be something like a 12 month term. And then, you know, the deals that I was locking in at there were 12 and 14% at the beginning of last year, well, that was good when you're paying 3% in your HELOC, but now I'm paying seven. So as those have come to an end, then I'm rolling them into higher interest opportunities. It could be like 16 or 18%. Oh, wow. That's a really good return. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's really good. And that leads me to my next question. Traditionally, we, um, we've been taught and we believe that our, our money is best um, sitting in the bank. How... Yeah, let me, tell me what your thoughts are on that. You, I know that you know what I'm getting at, but yeah. uh, would you would you suggest diversifying um, by having money in, in in real estate or just leaving it on the bank? And like, what are your thoughts around it? Yeah, I mean, I've generally I've had a couple of bad experiences with investing money with advisors and with the bank and stuff like that. And I guess what it comes down to for me is I like the tangibility of real estate and the fact that there's land and an asset. So in some ways, I feel like that is more secure than the money markets that seem to go up and down like with the weather, right? Yeah. So, and you're even hearing about banks closing and just things happening. So I think there is some uncertainty. I do have family that actually, you know, they lost a lot of money back in the 2008 uh, recession and stuff like that, just because they trusted their advisor and then things happened and they had too much invested in, in one thing, right? So there's a lot of things kind of wrapped up in that, but I also just don't like the ambiguity. So for example, if you have money invested, like sometimes you don't know what your return is. You don't know what the bank is actually making on your return. And you have to almost keep putting money into it to start seeing it grow because otherwise you'll, you'll start losing so much money and fees that balance will go down. So I think depending on what your priorities are, you want to have a balance. Like, I think it's good to have 
the lending for the cash flow, but then you also want to have the long-term equity that's building in the way of assets. So if you can balance your portfolio with those things, so that way, you know, years down the road, you have a bit of both because with private lending at the end of the term, you get your principal back, but it's not like it grows the way that equity does in the sense, say you bought something for 500,000 today, that's worth a million dollars 10 years from now. So it just depends on, on your priorities. Like if you have a high income job, like you might want something that's more equity based. Oh, okay. No, that's great. And I think that's really important for, for women in business to, to really um, just know and understand. Cause as you mentioned earlier, <laughs> excuse me, you don't want to be completely dependent on your, your business. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm really happy to hear you say that because I feel that same way about my business. Like, it's like, I can't just be dependent on this. I need, I need another source of income. I need, yeah, to, yeah just to, even just to diversify as, yeah. as you've mentioned. Well, so and, and things happen like life happens, right? So that could be anything like you could lose your job. There could be a life event. You could have an illness. A family member could have an illness and there could be different reasons that you can't actually work for a period of time anymore. Right. So I think it's just smart to, you know, have other sources of income because I think there's nothing riskier than one source of income, <laughs> you know, and I never, I didn't always think about it that way, but I think, you know, I was motivated to do some of these things based on the fact that I was trying to start a family and mm. I'm grateful that I did because nobody knew that the pandemic was coming. Right. And there's a lot of people that really suffered during that time because they, they couldn't work and they couldn't bring in the income that they had. And fortunately I was able to, to start this stuff beforehand and really kind of live comfortably and, and kind of get through it. So. Yeah, no, that's great. And what would you say is the biggest thing you've learned in your real estate investing journey? Yeah, I think the biggest thing I've learned is just, again, not to put too much into one company or one deal. Uh, when I started out, the education company that I joined really advocated for one particular mortgage brokerage. And I did a few deals with them that were fairly sizable. Um, and they all were laddered with 12-month, 18-month, and 24-month terms. And we're sitting here now five years later, and one and a half of those are basically still kind of in limbo, I guess you could say. Um, so they turned out to be a little bit different than I expected them to be. And chances are they're probably not paying out for another couple of years. So what should have been like an 18 month term will be like seven years by the end of it. So I think, um, you know, definitely would diversify just as much as possible and do less money per deal. And in this case as well, they had a split interest where you got half of it upfront monthly, half would be at the end when the term is over. But the problem is they keep moving the target for the end date, right? Just based on the circumstances of um, the deal being land development. So it's just gone on and on and on. We're kind of, as investors, held a little bit hostage in this situation. But I would say if only one and a half of like 60 deals has gone moderately sideways, like that's that's not bad. And they're still paying their upfront interest. So, you know, that's just, it's just gone on for much longer. So I think you just have to be careful and try to really understand the exit strategy and do due diligence. So you really know exactly what it is that you're investing in and, you know, what happens if, if things get delayed, right. So that you don't find yourself in a position where you, you know, what if you needed that money back? Right. So I think you just have to be mindful of all of those things. That's awesome. So in 10 seconds, your message of love, light and inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, we rise by lifting others. Awesome. Thank you so much, Serena. This was, this was a, a great chat and very educational. Awesome. Thanks for having me. And thanks to our viewers for watching. We'll see you next time on another episode of At the Heart of Business. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media.